I couldn't help as we're singing those songs. Um, obviously, there's a lot going on in your life. Uh, there's a lot going on in my life. Um, to be honest with you, it's it's an awkward time for us. Every church I go into, you know, they talk about, um, you know, having a prayer time for selecting the next DS, you know, and um, I think you all know this, like God's got this all figured out. Um, God's not up wringing his hands right now, stressed out over what's going on. Um, but, I, but I do believe, like the songs that we just sang, um, I can't help but think, like I wrestle with it. Like what if we really meant it? Like we just sang a song called Have Your Own Way. Uh, what if we all just had the posture of, God, whatever you want, <laughs> whatever you want, I'm all yours, I'm all in. Like, whatever you want in my life. And, and as I'm wrestling with what's going on in our future, and, and again, just to be transparent with you, I'm, I'm in a weird spot in life. I don't know what I'm going to do next. Um, it's a scary spot to be at 43 years old, not to know what's going to happen in my life in three weeks. Um, but I want to have the posture in life and not just say it from up here, but like really live it. God, have your way with my life. Whatever you want me to do, I'm just going to say yes to you. Uh, I'm not into titles. I'm not into positions. I'm not into, um, I'm not into needing to be up front. Uh, God, whatever you want in my life, I'm just going to say yes to. It's a scary spot to be in, but, but what if we all had that attitude? Um, <clears throat> in this position, uh, as a district superintendent, um, and you all know too well, um, you, you, see, <laughs> you see the good, the bad, the ugly of the church. Um, some days you get really nice emails. Some days you get horrible emails from holiness folk. Um, and you can't help but think, um, God, if we just really meant what we just sang, have your own way, what would happen in our churches? What would happen in our communities? What would happen in our homes? I think you all could agree with me that as we look outside these walls, we're living in a mess. Um, not to be the bearer of bad news today, because it's going to get good. But I think we'd all agree we're living in a mess. Um, I, I feel like, depending on what crowd I'm with, I'm, I'm either a really young person or I'm an old person, depending on who you talk to. So I'm kind of in that middle, you know. Um, and so I like hanging out with older people right now because I'm a young guy to them. But in my, in my lifetime, I've seen so many crazy changes in our world. What was once wrong now is right. And what was once right is now wrong. And we're confused on everything. And, and I'm trying to raise kids up in this messy, crazy, confused world. And we're living in a world where we're just looking and hoping like the right politician will be put into office. And if we can get the right politician that, that fits into my mold, then everything's going to be okay. And then we go back to Scripture, and Scripture says, don't put your trust in those suckers, <laughs> you know? Put your trust in the creator of heaven and earth, the one who made this place. It would be something if the church just woke up, <laughs> just really woke up and said, God, have your own way. It's not about me anymore. It's not about what I want, what I like. We're living in a strange time where we, we follow a Jesus who says, listen, I want you to take up your cross and follow me. <laughs> I want you to live a life of service. In fact, if you want to be great, you must serve. If you want to be first, you got to be last. And he calls us to a life of sacrifice and service. And yet we, we are trying to do these churches all across America that cater to people's needs. Because we want you to be happy. And if you're happy, you come back the next week. But yet I feel like Jesus is calling us to something different. And what if in this crazy, tumultuous time that we live in, what if we all just said, all right, we're no longer going to get consumed with those things. 
hey, I got three weeks left. I can say whatever I want because I'm out of here. Say whatever I want. But what if we said, Jesus, it's not about, it's not about me. It's not about me. You've called me. And I don't know exactly what it's going to look like. But I'm going to follow your spirit wherever he takes me. <laughs> and I'm telling you, it's not going to be right here in this place all the time. This isn't as good as it gets, you guys. But the spirit's going to follow, lead us outside this building and into our workplace and into our neighborhoods and into our communities into a world that's in desperate need of Jesus Christ. Desperate need of Him. And they're waiting for somebody to bring them some good news in a time where, where I just spent 125 bucks to fill my vehicle yesterday. You know? People are in a mess. We're living in this just difficult time, and, and people are waiting for some good news. And I feel like the church has like drawn this line and we're shaking our fist and saying it's us against you. But then we open up the Gospels. <laughs> and when you open up the Gospels, like it messes up everything that we do in church. I'm telling you, it does. It messes up everything. Because Christ has called us to be his body, his hands and his feet and his mouthpiece. And we discover that when we really decide to be the body of Christ and we read about Christ in the Gospels, it challenges us on how we do this. I'll give you an example today. I'm going to take some, some really simple stories that probably most of us in this room have heard and we're going to apply it to our lives and say, okay, Father, what do you want us to do about this? And, and how do you want us to apply this to our everyday lives? So if you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Luke. <clears throat> Jeff Eichhorn wanted me to preach really long today, so I'm just going to do that as his last request. So, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> We're going to go through Luke chapter 15, but before we do, I, I was reading it not too long ago, and I, I came across something that that I'm not saying, hey, this was done on purpose or, you know, trying to tie it together as if it was done. But I just found it interesting. At the end of Luke chapter 14, when, when Jesus is sharing about what the cost of what it means to follow him, again, which um, Jesus would not have been good in this church growth movement. Because he would stand up in front of believers and say, hey, listen, there's a high cost to this. It's not easy, Okay. It's not all about you, and it's not about your comfort and the songs you like and the style you like. It's not about that. Jesus says, listen, there's a cost to this. In fact, it's so heavy, it could cost you your life, you know. And, and I find it interesting, all across America, people like lead churches over music, you know. And Jesus said, listen, this is a cost you your life. You've got to be all in in this. And, and so Jesus talks about what it costs to follow him and and he spoke in parables a lot. And, and at the very end of Luke chapter 14, Jesus says this, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, as followers of Christ, we would all read that and say, Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tune into that, right? I have ears. I'm going to listen to whatever he says. But I find it interesting in that time that the people who should have listened to him are, are the ones who studied the law, the religious people who you know, grew up diving into that stuff. But, but I love that, that, again, I'm not saying this is done on purpose, but I just find it interesting. It ends with, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then in Luke 15, it starts off with this. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? It, it wasn't the religious people. It wasn't the people who, who should have been sitting around to hear him. Jesus says, hey, he who has an ear to hear, open up your ears to listen to this. And then all of a sudden, a group of tax collectors and sinners, <laughs> the bad guys, were gathering around Jesus to hear him. I can't help but ask myself, like, when's the last time I heard him? I mean, when's the last time you can pinpoint in your life, like, I know Jesus is speaking to me. And here's how I know. 
I feel like we're, we're so bombarded with all this noise and politics and social media and all this stuff. And, and Jesus says things like, hey, listen, my sheep will know my voice. <laughs> They'll know my voice. And I wonder about you, like when's the last time you can say in your life that you just know that you know that you know that you know that you heard from Jesus, that he spoke to you? So here's this picture of these tax collectors and these sinners. I find it interesting that that tax collectors (laughs) had their own separate category, you know? There's not only sinners, but yeah, you know, there's... (laughs) The IRS. No. <laughs> there was tax collectors and sinners. The worst of the worst. The people who turned their back on their faith. The people who looked at their faith and they shook their fists and said, no, I'm going to choose this. But yet they wanted to be around Jesus at this time. I'm always amazed that those people who were nothing like Jesus wanted to be around Jesus. And then I evaluate what's going on in our world today, you know. (laughs) We've drawn the line in the sand, but people who are nothing like Jesus wanted to be around Jesus. And and so you know the story. There's a group of tax collectors and sinners all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. I looked up the Greek word for muttered, and it means muttered. So we all can guess what muttered means. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Again, it's a picture of Jesus who who not only welcomes sinners in, he invests time into them. He takes the time to sit down and eat with them and and have conversations with them. And Jesus doing what he did so well, he goes into some parables to kind of share the heart of his father. And you know the parables. It's the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the lost son. And we've heard these stories, right? The the parable of the lost sheep. I'm not going to just read it through you. I'm going to just share with you, but then we're going to dive into the next one. The lost sheep is simple. A shepherd out one day is, is counting his sheep. You know, 96, 97, 98, 99. And I'm sure the sheep were moving around, you know. And so he had to start all over, and he starts counting his sheep, and he should have 100 sheep. We know the story. And he gets to 96, 97, 98, 99. There's one missing. Now listen, I'm not a farmer. I'm not a sheep farmer. I'm not a shepherd. But I'm just going to be honest with you. I would count 99 sheep and say, you know what? That's a really good percentage, you know? <laughs> That's a really good percentage. But we get a picture of the heart of the Father. It says, a high percentage isn't good enough. There's one lost sheep. So as the shepherd leaves the 99, leaves the 99 and goes out and searches for that one lost sheep. We know the story. When he finds the sheep, he gets all fired up. He, he doesn't smack the sheep on the side of the head and say, bad sheep, you know. He doesn't throw a collar and a leash on it and drag him back. It says that he picks him up, puts him on his shoulders, gets back, and he calls all his shepherd friends. He says, I want you to rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. And Jesus says, listen, there's more rejoicing over one sinner coming to repentance than 99. I tell you, that story should shake us in the church to shake us because we and listen I fall into it (laughs) okay I fall into it it's it's easy for me to preach about these things but I want to live this we can get so consumed with this and this I'm not saying this isn't important okay this is good keep doing it Lee Ray this is good (laughs) keep doing this but this isn't it in fact Jesus says this isn't even the most important thing Because outside these walls, there's lots of lost sheep that our Heavenly Father is crazy about, that He loves deeply. So we know the story, and then it gets into the next story. And I want us to focus a little bit in this story, because I just, I think it's a great story. Chapter 8, it says, suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it? 
And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there's more rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. Okay, it's, it's a pretty simple story, right? We can hear that story, because, and we can all relate to it, right? Just by show of hands, how many, how many have ever lost something? Right? Some of you spouses are elbowing, you know, the person next to you, right? We can relate to it. We've all lost something, okay? It's, it's, not a, it's not like a deep story that you have to pick apart and dive into it, but it's a story that I think Jesus made simple for a reason, because we all can apply it to our lives, and it, and it makes sense, because we've all lost something. Now, in our day, it's a little bit different. This woman, she had 10 coins, and she loses one of them. Now, in our context, we think, well, <laughs> no big deal, you know. <laughs> that goes shake my couch. You'll find plenty of coins, you know. Or, or look underneath my vehicle in the center council. You'll find coins, you know. You, you go through McDonald's, and they got a, a dollar Diet Coke, which isn't healthy. But I may buy a lot of them. I can dig in my center council, and I can count on coins being in there. It's not a big deal for us. In fact, I need every one of you to get a coin, okay? Right now, you have, find a coin. If you don't have a coin, I, I pull coins out of my center council, and you can just put up your hand, or if you've got somebody next to you, you can get a coin. I need everybody to have a coin. So important. Who doesn't have a coin? You guys are just wanting my money, aren't you? You guys need coins back here? You got coins? We're good? Up here? Is everybody getting coins? Okay, we're going to up it. Now we're going to go to dollar bills. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay, if you want this coin back, don't give it away to somebody, okay? Everybody have a coin? Now, again, it's hard in our context to understand this, but, but in Jesus' day, and, and you read commentaries on it, and there's all sorts of, like, theories and ideas about, about why this coin would be important. One is it was, it was purposely probably said that Jesus said it was a woman, um, and it wasn't a sexist thing, but in that day, women just couldn't go out and work like men could. They couldn't go out and, and have a... Uh, make a good living like men could. And so many of them had to depend on a spouse or somebody to help them. And so for her to have 10 coins and lose one of them, it was a big deal. That coin had value to it. It was important to that person. And what I find so interesting is Jesus uses this, this woman and this coin to, to maybe just maybe tell us that, that our lost coins have value to us. Now, I want you to think about this, and this is why I had you take out a coin. What if you put a name and face to your lost coin? The reality is, is every one of us probably in this room have somebody that's valuable to us, right? That we wouldn't say they're bad or horrible people. We would just say they're lost. And they're important to us. I'm amazed as I go across the district <laughs> how many pastors are just torn up inside because of a, a child <laughs> that they've raised a certain way and, and they did their best, to, but for whatever reason, that child just took a different path. And they're not following God right now. And they would say, you know what, they're, they're lost. And, and they have high value to me. They're important to me. Some of you in here have children. You poured into and you raised a certain way and you, you drug them to church and, and you did your absolute best, but, but for whatever reason, they just kind of took a different path. And they're lost. And they have high value to you, don't they? They're important to you. Some of you are grandparents in here. <laughs> grandparents are crazy. <laughs> yeah, you know you are, aren't you, Right? Like you let your grandkids get away with things that you never let your kids get away with. Yeah, right? Right? You all, this crowd is rowdy today. And they're important to you, aren't they? 
I mean, I'm amazed to watch grandparents, how they just absolutely love and pour into their grandkids. And, and grandparents, your desire is that your grandkids follow Jesus, isn't it? It's your desire. But we all know this, that kids, as they grow older, they make their own decision. And for some of you, have grandkids. And for whatever reason, have just kind of taken a different path. They're lost. They have value to you. For some, it's a spouse or a sibling. We all have somebody in our lives that's so significant to us. That's so important to us. And they're lost. <laughs> they're lost. And so what I want you to do is I just want you to put a name and face to your coin. You don't have to say it out loud, but just who is your valuable person in your life that you love and care about deeply? And they're just lost. Mine is, I got a nephew. <laughs> he's just a good kid, but he's so confused with all the things that the world's throwing at him. Um, he's pulled in every direction. And, and his parents, they, they raised him in the church and did their best, but, but he went off to college and, and just for whatever reason just started to make some poor decisions. And, and he's, he's not a bad kid. He's just lost. There's value to that person. Well, not only is there value, I find it so interesting that the, the woman went to great lengths to find the coin, and she never gave up. <laughs> I mean, you can picture the story, right? Because we've all been there. It says that she, she searched under her bed, she lit a lamp, and she tore the house apart, and she tipped over the sofa, and she shook it, and and she swept the house clean, and she looked, and she looked, and she, she searched, and searched, and searched, and she never gave up on that lost coin. I think maybe, just maybe, Jesus is telling us, like, hey, listen, we need to go to great lengths to see that our valuable lost coins are found. What are the things that we are doing every day to make sure that our lost coins are found. Now, there's some things that we can do that, that maybe sometimes we chalk up as, well, it's the last resort. But, but Scripture says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Like, what if we just dedicated every day, and I know some of you do, but you just dedicated every day that you're going to take a chunk of your day and you're just going to pray for that lost coin in your life. Holy Spirit, would you just soften their hearts? Holy Spirit, would you just, wherever they're at right now, would you just draw near to them? Would you challenge them? Would you, would you convict them? Would you overwhelm them with your love? Could you imagine if you just said every day, I'm going to pray for that lost coin? My dad tells a story of being at the bedside of a man in his 90s who was passing away. <laughs> and as he was passing away, this man in his 90s said, after my dad led him to Christ on his deathbed, this is an answer to my mom's prayers who died many, many years ago. And she prayed every day for me. I want to challenge us. This woman went to great lengths to find her coin. I challenge you. Make it a priority in your life to pray every day for that lost coin. But then go do those things that would point that person to Jesus. Love on them. Don't smack them on the side of the head. Pour into them. Give them a good example of what a follower of Jesus Christ looks like. This woman searched and searched, and she never gave up. Here's what I find way too often with our lost coins, and I've done it. We pray for a chunk of time. We work on them for a chunk of time. And then we just kind of have the mindset of, oh, they're a lost cause and we give up. I want to challenge you. Don't give up on your lost coin. They're too valuable. They're too important. Don't give up on them. If, if you've given up praying for, for that child or that grandchild or that spouse or that friend, I'm telling you, get back into it. If you've given up talking to them, sharing your faith with them, plugging Jesus into every conversation you can, I would encourage you to keep doing it and not give up on that lost coin. 
And then what I love about the story is there's nothing more exciting than finding something that is lost. <laughs> and we've all been there, right? There's nothing more exciting than finding something that's lost. A few years ago, um, I had a black lab. His name was Bear. Um, Bear, um, he passed away about a year and a half ago at 15 years old. I mean, he's just an old fat sucker. <laughs> but he was, he was part of our family. Like, my kids didn't know life without Bear. And uh, it, was, it was a few years ago where, where we were down in Salem, Illinois. We were living down there, and we lived on five acres, and, and we had a pond in our backyard. But, but we had a fence in our backyard so Bear wouldn't get loose. And Bear was like our, he was part of our family. Well, one day I go in the backyard and Bear is gone. Gone, nowhere to be found. And, and the gate was latched. And I thought, what in the world, you know? Did Bear jump the fence? Did somebody come and grab him? And I had all these thoughts go through my mind. And, well, I knew Bear, if he got out, he wouldn't go very far. I mean, he's just, he stayed close all the time. There's many times where Bear got out. He would figured out how to unlatch the gate and he would stay close. But but I would walk around our five acres, and, and I'd say, bear, you know, bear. And just thinking eventually bear's going to come back, and bear never came back. Well, the day went by, and I started to get nervous. And, of course, you can put stuff out on social media now, say, hey, listen, my dog is gone, and it's a black lab, you know. Um, he's got a collar that's black. And the only thing that you can tell that he's different from any other dog is he's got like a weird black spot inside his mouth. But he's a black lab. Threw it out on social media. There are black labs everywhere in southern Illinois. <laughs> everywhere. I mean, I was, getting a, I was getting calls all night long. Hey, we see this black lab. And so I'd get in my vehicle and I'd drive across town and I'd come see this dog and it wasn't bear, you know. And Day goes by, two days go by, three days go by. Every morning I'd go out on my back deck, bear, bear, just thinking eventually he's going to come back. Didn't come back. Well, I started calling people. We were part of a good-sized church, you know, and, and, I, and I threw it out on our prayer chain, you know, real spiritual, like, help me find my dog, you know, and. And we got the whole church looking for my dog, and eventually the whole town was looking for my dog, and eventually people in North Dakota who followed me on social media were looking for my dog, and like we had half the country looking for my dog, and, and everybody, it was the talk of the whole town, and everybody was saying, hey, have you found Pastor Mike's dog, you know, and we're looking, and I think I see it, and, and I got the whole community, the whole church looking for my dog. A week goes by, seven days, just came to the conclusion that my dog was gone. I was going to give it one last shot, and I go out on my deck, and I'm yelling for bear. Bear. And then I heard a bump behind me under my house. Now, my house, Jeff, this is weird, had a crawl space. And on the crawl space, the door, and I'm not a, I'm, there's no way you could ever get me to crawl under a crawl space, okay? I'll call somebody to come crawl under my crawl space. Crawl space had a door that would swing open, but it wouldn't swing out, right? And Bear got into the crawl space underneath my house, and he couldn't get out. And Bear wasn't a barker. He wasn't a whiner. He's just a quiet dog. And I thought, no way. And I go to the crawl space door, and I push it open, and Bear explodes out of underneath my house, skinny bugger, see his ribs, and he starts doing laps around the yard, you know, and the kids come running out, and they were so excited, and the kids were crying and yelling, and, and they're chasing bear around the yard, and bear's licking them all over, and, and I'm feeling like the world's worst dog owner at the time, you know, but I was so excited, because bear was such an important part of our family, and there was so much excitement, and we were all fired up. And I just started calling everybody. You won't believe this. Guess where Bear was? Underneath my house. 
Of course, after about two people calling them and saying how horrible a person I was, I stopped calling people, but, <laughs> but I was so excited that we found bear. There was legit excitement. And I want to tell the world, I find it interesting that I could get the whole church to look for my dog. <laughs> my dog. Wouldn't it be something if we all got that passionate about each other's lost coins? Wouldn't that be something? If I cared enough about you and you and you and you and you and, and I cared enough about you and your lost coins where, where I said, hey, listen, we're going to go out in search of this coin. <laughs> I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to search with you. If I can get the whole town to look for my dog, wouldn't it be something if I could get my church to help me find my lost coin? Because I'm telling you, there's nothing more exciting in the church than finding lost coins. What would it do for this church if every week <laughs> Lee Ray was having to pull out a baptismal because lost coins were consistently being found? And our mission in this church was not just to come and check the box on Sunday, but our mission as a church was to find each other's lost coins and knock on the door of heaven until those lost coins are found and say, we are not going to settle for anything less than lost coins being found. Because when her coin was found, Scripture says she got on her cell phone and called everybody. Not exactly on her cell phone. So she called out to her neighbors and says, rejoice with me. Celebrate with me. I've lost my coin, which was valuable to me, and I didn't give up on it, but I want you to celebrate with me because my coin that was lost is it's now in its rightful place. Jesus says, listen, you guys, there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner comes into repentance. And so maybe, just maybe, our lost coins need to become priority again in our churches. And maybe, just maybe, the things that we celebrate, because we celebrate things in the church, don't we? We do. We celebrate all sorts of things. But what if the number one thing we celebrated in the church again was lost coins being found? I'm just going to take a guess here. All of us in here have lost coins. We all do. I do, you do. I want to be something. If we loved each other so much that my lost coin mattered to you and your lost coin mattered to me and I wasn't going to be so concerned about music, style, stuff, how nice my chair is, and you guys got great chairs. But that stuff, that's, I'm not going to celebrate those things. I'm going to celebrate when our lost coins are found. And all of us have them. And I believe this. We want to save the world, right? I do. But I got people really close to me that are lost. People that are important to me that are lost. And I'd love to be with a group of people that care enough about my lost coin and I care enough about their lost coin to where I see the value in them, where I help search and search and I pray and I pray and I don't give up on them. And when they're found, there's nothing better than finding something lost. When they're found, we celebrate together. I would love for a greater life every week. You all just celebrate finding lost coins. <laughs> in order for us to do that, that has to be priority again. It has to be priority. Stephen, I don't know if you can bring your team up. Just play something in the background. I want to wrap this up with just some prayer time. I'm not going to ask you to name them, but I would challenge you to this at some point with your church body. Uh, the people that that scripture describes as people that you would be willing to give your life for, this group, to share who your lost coin is. But if you have a name and face to
to your coin right now. I just want you to just kind of hold your coin up right now. You got a name and face to your coin. We all do, right? We all do. I think it'd be appropriate for us on this Sunday morning for us to maybe, just maybe, take this story to heart. Let's be persistent. Let's not give up. Let's make it a priority in our lives to go after these coins. Let's pull others into it with us. And let's start celebrating again when lost coins are found. And so I don't, I don't think my prayer is any more special than your prayer, but I want to pray right now for your lost coin. Because I want you to know I don't know most of you very well. But what Christ has been challenging me on lately is the importance of your lost coins. Um, I got I got three kids. Uh, 18-year-old, 17-year-old, and 15-year-old. Um, which you can imagine um, the, the challenge that most of you felt raising teenagers. Uh, teenagers, again, I've mentioned this, you're all a mystery to us. Like, we don't get you mystery but we're crazy about you and as a dad there's nothing more important to me than for my kids to follow Jesus I mean, I mean that, there's, there's nothing more important to me nothing more important to me so my kids right now are all following Jesus, okay but if one of them ever wanders off, you know what my hope is is that I got a group of people that care enough about me and my family that will help me find my lost coin. So I don't know all of you, and I don't know your circumstances, and I don't know your coin, but, but I do believe in the power of prayer, and I believe that, again, what Scripture says about prayer is important. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So before we sing, why don't we just wrap up with, with all of us praying for our lost coins, okay? And let's make this a priority in our lives, in our church, in our small groups, in our conversations with each other, okay? Because... Someday we're all going to stand before the Almighty. No pressure, right? Scripture says his eyes are like fire. And my hope is when I step in there that I know that my kids and my grandkids, my wife, are someday going to be there with me. Nothing's more important than that. So let's make it a priority with each other that we're going to care enough about each other, that we're going to make sure that heaven is full of each other's kids and grandkids and spouses. Okay? Let's pray together. Jesus, we love you.